Thank you very much, Simon, for the kind invitation to speak here today. Um, and I think it's a real great project that you have going with this um, lecture series. And it's really helping to bring the international gesture studies community together um, in this time when we don't have in-person conferences so often. Um, so that's a, a great thing that you're doing and I really appreciate that. And I'm uh, honored to be here as uh, one of the speakers um, in this talk series. So as the title says, um, I'll be talking about language and gesture, how they work together um, from a perspective, uh, mainly from cognitive linguistics. Um, but I'd like to start with a view um, that many people have that is somewhat different and actually a, a view um, that goes back quite a ways, which looks at traditional levels of linguistic structure in terms of, let's say the sounds, the parts of words or phrases as really um, a group unto themselves as a category that is a framed, bordered category uh, with a rather strict boundary in terms of uh, many linguists consider what counts as a phoneme or a morpheme as a yes or no kind of question. Um, other phenomenon involved in communication like intonation and gesture then fall outside of this system according to this, according to this view. Um, and that would also then include things like laughing or coughing, clearing one's throat. Um, these would all be considered various kinds of paralinguistic phenomenon outside of what is considered linguistic. Um, both in terms of uh, language in general, as well as for any specific language. Um, and what Lakoff and, and Taylor and some others have said is that this reflects a, a classical category structure and their uh, use of this term means that we then, if we think of something as a classical category, we think of it as having a clear boundary. So um, many linguists consider language uh, as a kind of container in which we have syntax, morphology, phonology, all of those things are linguistic and everything else is then paralinguistic. And I wanna problematize that, um, that view a bit here. Um, the background is that the, what is considered linguistic is considered what we can uh, quantify in some way. It's quantal in that sense, uh, categorical, as opposed to the paralinguistic, which then can be considered on a scale or as gradient in different ways. And what I want to talk about today and suggest is that this is a problem and say that um, human communication is much more fluid and dynamic and variable than this in terms of its forms. Um, and so if we look at communication from a big picture, this view uh, presents us with some difficulties. What I'd like to focus on and turn to is a view, an alternative view in cognitive linguistics, um, which then has different starting points, uh, namely that language is then governed by general cognitive principles rather than by, say, a special purpose language module. And much of our knowledge of language emerges from use, from practice. Um, and this is a view that's been put forth, for example, by Ron Lanneker in his uh, volumes, various volumes on cognitive grammar. Um, and actually the ideas that I'm talking about today, I just happen to have the book right here, his 2008 uh, basic introduction to cognitive grammar. And a lot of these ideas that I'm talking about today developed when I was asked to review this book uh, about 10 years ago for the journal Language. And as I started reading it, I realized that Lanneker was really talking about semiotics in a broader sense, even though he's not using that term. So actually the theory of cognitive grammar could be seen as having bigger implications than beyond just uh, language itself. So that was the beginning of some of these ideas. And in cognitive grammar, um, what Lanneker proposes is that the, um, the words and the grammar uh, consist of linked phonological and semantic structures. And this is a rather traditional view in many approaches to linguistics, um, going back to at least to Saussure. Um, and if we think about these four meaning associations from a cognitive grammar perspective, the idea is that they are schematized and entrenched to varying degrees. And this idea of varying degrees already sets us on the path to then questioning the boundary that we just saw in that uh, image of the, the linguistic sign. Um, it already starts making us question what's involved with this boundary here. Um, so that's what I wanna 
look at today and problematize a bit more. If we think about this, uh, this idea of entrenchment, it's familiar in, in um, many approaches in linguistics. We think of expressions like in English, I am going to do that. Um, and then we say, I'm, I'm going to do that. Or using gonna itself, I automatically ran into that uh, pronunciation. So this uh, kind of change represents one form of schematization. Um, but we see this happening all the time in different uh, forms and, and categories in linguistics. So um, I also want to mention a little plug here for a work of one of my PhD students, um, Jincheng Huang, who's working on uh, separable verbs in Chinese, these li he zi, as um, constructions. Um, and they're a kind of interesting problem because you have two parts that are involved there, but then sometimes they're considered uh, as one thing and used together and other times are separate. Um, so this idea of entrenchment comes into play. Um, if anyone wants to follow up with him, I can put uh, his contact information in the chat later. Um, and what I wanna look at is what kinds of form and meaning associations are schematized and entrenched by language users to varying degrees. If we take this idea seriously um, and look into what's going on in face-to-face -face communication especially, and I'll look at a few categories uh, today. So the traditional ones, the spoken morphemes, let's say lexemes, words, the kind of default prototype we think of in language use, but then also non-lexical sounds, intonation contours, gesture as well. One might even think of other categories and see how this works with this idea of schematization and entrenchment. So let's start with the, the non-lexical sounds um, since they're already getting us outside of that uh, category of what most people think of um, in terms of the language category. So if we think of an American English, we have forms like um, uh or hmm, yeah. And even with yeah, there's different forms of it that might, uh, might be used. There are forms that some people would not really consider words, but yet some dictionaries actually include them. Um, and they vary a lot in terms of how they can be produced. And they have sets of meanings, but the different variants in, within each group vary a bit in terms of how fixed their meanings are. So if you say um, something like, yeah, maybe it's less clear than a, a yeah is, for example. And we can even take this further. So let's uh, move out a bit and say if someone <clears throat> they cleared their throat, they just exhale or they make a kind of click sound. Um, those can also be used in communicative context to signal something. They could be a response, a turn, a talk, uh, but they're not usually considered communicative forms. So if we think of this, what we have um, are some forms that are more fixed in terms of a form meaning pairing um, and others that are less so. And this already gives us this idea with these non-lexical sounds, we have a, a range or a, a gradient of uh, different forms that have a different kind of status as far as conventional signs go. So again, going back to our Saussurian sign and the, um, the concept and the, the um, form of expression that go together. So let's turn to um, the next category, so intonation contours. Intonation, if you think of that, we have symbolic relations of different kinds, but again, varying degrees. So some form meaning correspondences are more fixed to each other and others are less so. If we think of, again, in, say in American English, um, if we have a form like, I don't know. We might have a prototypical pronunciation, I don't know. Some kind of low, high, medium intonation. Um, or someone negating something and saying, uh-uh. So um, this uh, high, low, uh-uh intonation can even be done uh, mm -mm, with your mouth closed. Uh, you might indicate your response that way of negation. So the intonation contour in itself can carry the meaning. Um, some intonation contours are even more broader in their scope of use. Let's say this kind of low, high, uh, kind of pattern in English could be used to indicate a, a question or surprise in some way, less specific in meaning of something like, I don't know. It's just um, general, um, let's say surprise here. And others can be even used for a wider range of meaning. So, Simply uh, the fact that high intonation in, in English is often used for new information, lower um, 
intonations are used for more known information. This is a really then broad kind of pattern. So once again, we see a range where there's uh, certain forms of intonation that are used with more clear conventional status as uh, communicative forms and others less so. Um, so we have again a kind of continuum. If we go to gestures, here we have the well-known uh, so-called Kendon's continuum that uh, McNeil proposed based on Kendon's earlier work. Here's an adaptation of it. And this has been developed uh, by other people as well. For example, the Tour of Grammar and Gesture project years ago, um, where they then picked up on some of that work and then came up with even a new category in a sense, talking about recurrent gestures. Um, and I'll take a look at each of these, but already from what was proposed by McNeil and by Kendon, um, they already propose that there's a kind of continuum in terms of different degrees of conventional status that um, co-speech gesture forms have. So if we look at the emblems, uh, if we begin with them, um, familiar category for many people in gesture studies, there's a standardized form meaning relation that has a fixed status within a culture. There are forms that are considered to be used intentionally. Um, if we think of some different uh, examples, um, so again, if we talk about, let's say, at least European and American cultures, um, thumbs up, something is good. This is an advertisement from many years ago. You can get something for free there. Um, and it's rare that we know the origin of an emblem. So maybe, you know, this one, thumbs up, maybe goes back to ancient Rome and, you know, the emperor making a decision about uh, somebody's life or death, for example. Um, um, but some developed more recently. So this hand heart kind of gesture, um, is attributed uh, to the specific musician who then used this in her concerts uh, to show appreciation to her fans so in the 2000s already. Um, and then spread now has become so common it's even seen in uh, Belarus recent demonstrations, um, people using it uh, to the police to try to show, look, we're not against you. This is, that's not what it's about. Um, we're all in this together. Um, so this became a symbol that uh, was then used even with a different kind of political meaning or something like this, which again is culture specific. So here's a Dutch uh, speed skater um, who is using it as a, hey, that's cool, everything's great um, kind of sign. Um, but then I showed this to some other people in uh, Russia, for example, and they said, oh, that means he smokes pot. And I said, well, that's not what I thought. I thought it just meant it's, you know, hey, that's great. So these are culture specific, but they have clear, um, they have a clear status uh, in a given culture as, um, as signs that are then known and recognized by language users. If we go to this next category, the recurrent gestures, which really developed from that, that Togog project years ago, um, here we have recurrent groups of forms with limited range of variation um, and a related set of meanings, but it's a looser, and, and broader kind of group of pairs of forms and meanings that are going together. Um, just to take an example, so uh, here we have Whoopi Goldberg on a TV show. She was doing, this was four years ago when Donald Trump was a candidate, she was doing a, an interview with him by telephone and she wanted to get her point in. So she said, wait, 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 and holds up this uh, index finger. So this finger then um, can be used to say, wait, can be used to say attention, um, maybe in a restaurant you want to get attention, you want to order something. So it has a kind of loose set of meanings um, around this form. Or if we consider the palm up open hand gesture used in many different ways um, that can indicate something about maybe uh, resignation, maybe about questioning. Um, and there are articles, Cornelia Miller has a whole article uh, from 2004 on this palm up open hand. And we see um, from the work by uh, Miller and Bressem and others, these different forms that they found in, in German in a big collection of conversations that have since been found in a number of other European languages and even beyond um, uh, that setting that have forms that are fairly similar to each other. So there can be many different variants of this palm up open hand uh, form, performed in different ways. Um, this sort of uh, cyclic or cyclic gesture can be done in a lot of different, uh, different manners. Um, but the meanings, there's also a set of meanings that go with them 
And it's not a simple one-to-one -one relationship. It's sort of a group of meanings and a group of forms that go together, different variants um, of the, let's say this, you know, uh, throwing away gesture that can be done in, in to different degrees of intensity or different sizes, for example. So we have sets of forms and meanings that go together. It's a looser kind of relationship than we saw with the emblems. Then to take the more extreme end, we have the more idiosyncratic gestures, um, what Kenden called the gesticulation. So here we just take an example. This is a comedian. He's talking about um, a relationship. So he's talking um, about what's going on in relationships. And if you try to, if you don't know the context at all, and you look at this and you say, what is he doing? You might think maybe he's holding something. Um, you need to know a lot more about the context to know what this gesture means. Actually, what he's saying here is he's talking about a very old couple that they've been together for decades and he could see the connection that they had between them. So it's something about connecting and maybe even two sides and a relation, kind of some symmetric relation to each other where the two hands are maybe even the people them, themselves. So you, with these idiosyncratic gestures, you need a lot more context to know what's going on and to make sense of the meaning that's involved, what their function is. Um, they're not conventionally linked to a particular meaning, but they're understood in the given context based on the words that go with them, the spoken language, but also that certain forms of iconicity in the gesture that we see. So maybe about the, this matching of the uh, one side and the other presents a kind of idea of compatibility or joining together. So we have a range uh, then in gestures as well, in terms of this degree to which they're used as conventional signs. And we might even think of other forms of communication in which we also have this kind of um, range. Here we have a siren in the background here. It's another kind of communicative sign, I guess. So if we think of the um, traditional view, let's say, of the, you know, what's considered linguistic and what's considered paralinguistic, um, that's rather different. That really makes it, it seem, make it seem like there's a clear division between what's discrete and categorical versus what's gradient. Um, and I want to suggest this is a problem. So um, what can we do about this? Is the solution to consider spoken language as 100% multimodal? That's what some people would say. They would just say language is multimodal. Um, so then does the linguistic include all of these things? Um, Partly, I, I, it, I think this is somewhat of a problem, as I'm already suggesting, because what would this mean? Are we talking about modalities, the audio modality, visual communication, or are we talking about different modes or codes, semiotic systems of communication? Uh, is that what mode and multimodal means? Um, and I, I want to get into this a bit and think about this. Why is this a, a problem? And to just think of language as multimodal. Um, one is that gesture is not always used by speakers, uh, nor is it always seen by those who are paying attention to them. So attenders, uh, as Herb Clark has called them. And speech and gesture and other semiotic systems normally have different communicative statuses. So spoken language and grammatical items uh, for speakers of a language are a more independent semiotic system. You can listen to the radio and understand a lot of what they're talking about without seeing them. And spontaneous gesture is a more dependent semiotic system with spoken language. Um, and this is something also that um, Andrei Kibrik has uh, written about uh, in several works and also done some empirical research on. So what I'd like to propose is a solution, a way out of this, I think, um, where we think of spoken language as at least involving two semiotic systems very frequently, um, Lexico grammar, uh, that what's normally considered language itself, and intonation, since intonation for a speaker is impossible to divorce from the spoken words, even if you speak in a monotone, that's still a kind of intonation pattern. But I want to propose that these are then part of a variably um, uh, dynamic polysemiotic communicative system. And this idea of polysemiotic, I'm drawing on work by uh, Jonas Latte, for example who has, um, I don't know if he invented this term, but he's, he's certainly put forth this term uh, in a strong way as one that we should be using more. And I agree with him on this. Um, thinking about multiple semiotic systems, also William Morgenstern talking about plurisemiotic systems is a similar idea. This idea that we're using multiple semiotic systems at once. Um, 
So what is their nature? How can we think of them in terms of this larger polysemiotic system? How are they working? And if we go back to the work in the early years of cognitive science and categorization, thing, work by Eleanor Bosch, for example, influenced by Wittgenstein, mm -hmm. we see um, the importance of prototypes. And so if we go back to Leboff's work, for example, where he did a study back in 1973 talking about what do we call this? You know, he gave people this picture, an, an image, um, and if you say, well, that's a cup. Um, and then he gave them a series of other images where the diameter changed, um, but otherwise the form stayed the same with a little handle on it in this case. And the question is, uh, how far do you go in calling this a cup? Is this still a cup? Maybe it's a bowl already, a strange bowl with a handle. So what he found in his survey was that people call it a cup um, for quite a ways, you know, number two, number three, number four, but by number five, they're more likely to be calling it a bowl because of this uh, ratio. So there's a kind of change. The category has a um, gradation to it. But then he said, uh, in a variation on the study, he said, imagine the container filled with mashed potatoes on a dinner table. You might imagine it filled with uh, rice, for example, also it could have other kinds of food in it. How does, does that change what you call it? So is this, uh, still a cup if it has rice in it? Is this, is this? And what he found is that people then um, had a different way of using the terms cup and bowl for what they were seeing. So when there was, um, this is what we had before, the dark line, we had the cup and the bowl. So they uh, used cup for quite a ways. And here the lighter lines show what happened when there was food in it. So cup started getting used less and bowl started getting used more once people thought that there was food in it um, to the point then uh, calling it a cup, sorry, calling it a bowl surpassed uh, calling it a cup as we moved along. So it changed sooner uh, in terms of when people called it a bowl. So the context made a difference in this border, this uh, between the different word forms was then, uh, let's say, uh, variable along the scale. But we still have clear examples. We still have the, the small cup at the end that there was much less question about that that's a cup. So this led to this work on um, prototype theory, which uh, is still going on in some ways, but it was quite a big thing in the 1970s and 80s and really led to many ideas in um, cognitive linguistics. And in fact, talking about then word meaning. So what we're talking about here with the cup and the bowl is about semantics, lexical semantics, um, and proposing that word meanings can be thought of as prototype categories, not as ones with this very clear boundary on them, but with a clear center, and then it gets fuzzier as we go to the, to the boundary. Um, further research in um, uh, phonetics and phonology uh, also then looked at the different categories, the phoneme categories, and said, well, there we also see uh, gradients, like a salient prototype here is an example of a, a phoneme in a given language, but then there are fuzzy exemplars, less clear agreement on the categories as we get further away from that prototype. And then also grammatical constructions. So um, a number of different works looking at even grammatical constructions as prototype categories of um, clearer examples of them. Let's say the cause motion construction, I push something off the table. Um, and then less clear examples with other verbs. Um, the classic uh, example of sneezing the napkin off the table, not a prototypical caused motion verb but it could be used in that construction, kind of stretching it uh, with that meaning. So this idea of the um, units and languages being thought of as prototypes is something Joan Bybee picked up on. She said that there are all types of units proposed by linguists um, show gradients in the sense that there is a lot of variation within the domain of the unit, different types of words, morphemes, syllables, and difficulty in setting the boundaries of the unit. So she was pointing out it's a bigger, phenomenon that we're, that we're dealing with here. And again, I come back to Kubik's work where he talked about um, what he called focal structures in between discrete categories in a continuum. And so this is a courtesy of him, a um, slide here, which then points this out as he said, if you have discrete categories, two different entities versus a continuous structure, there's another 
alternative where we might have focal structures, where we might have a clear focus uh, in each case, two different ones, maybe an anchor point we can think of it as. But then there are different examples and some might be outliers further away and less prototypical. And if we get to an extreme case, then we might have a hybrid, in fact, between the two systems. So this allows for a way to think about the variability between um, categories in this sense of prototypes. And I think this is a, an effective way to think of this. Interesting, uh, Ersten Dahl back in 1979 in a um, paper in a footnote proposed that uh, according to prototype approach to categories, a concept or category will have the following, he called it a star-like structure. This was his way of imagining it with the focus and then certain extensions that go out from that. So already back in 1979, he was saying, this is a good way to think of um, semantic categories, but maybe other categories in linguistics. So if we think about language itself as a category with a prototype center, let's say our lexical and grammatical forms, and then a fuzzy boundary. So if we have these non-lexical vocalizations, that mm -hmm, yeah, that are word-like in some ways, they're more peripheral to a language. But then we can also see overlap with other semiotic systems. So the, the intonation by itself or the, the gesture forms, those emblems are more word-like, let's say, than the um, spontaneous gesticulation. And then we have different degrees, a, a kind of continuum that also changes on different timescales and by different contexts. And so this is something we can look at um, a bit more here. And this is something I've been thinking about uh, for the past 10 years or so. Um, maybe prototypes are a way to categorize many or all different communicative semiotic systems with a relatively stable, schematized, entrenched uh, basis for certain form meaning pairs and then others are more central, that are more central to the system and others that are more um, on the periphery, that are less schematized, less entrenched. Um, so maybe this is a more general way of thinking about how this works. And this fuzzy boundary then of language overlaps with other semiotic systems in a variable fashion. So if we think of language, kind of put this imagistically, we have our non-lexical sounds and gesture, we can think of them as um, kind of these spheres with uh, clearer centers and fuzzy boundaries. If we go back to relevance theory, another approach, um, they pointed out that speakers or writers or signers of a sign language, producers, can flexibly make use of a smaller or larger set of expressive behaviors. They pointed out that our focus um, varies according to what's relevant in the context in terms of being narrower and broader. Um, and if we think of some other work on attention, such as Todd Oakley's work, uh, he called it the distributed adjustable capacity of attention um, with using the, uh, the zoom lens metaphor that has been used by others um, as well in, in past research, um, that we then sometimes zoom in on something and focus on certain communicative behaviors of others and other times uh, zoom out and take a bigger perspective and then also some work on metaphors, such as um, Miller's work on um, highlighting, foregrounding a metaphor use by using certain big gestures, let's say, or dynamic gestures, and they might draw more attention than other smaller ones that are produced in a low space. There's a selective activation of the meaning in the given context of the gesture related to a metaphor that's being used. And I want to think of for a minute about how we characterize this overlap area of these different semiotic systems. And this idea of these different researchers that I just mentioned is going to come into play here. We can think of this all as involving a kind of dynamic scope of relevant behaviors in a given context. And so um, what I want to propose is that in, a given, in any communicative context, there is this dynamic scope of relevant behaviors um, that can differ also for the person producing the communicative forms, the speaker, the writer, the signer, and also for anyone paying attention to them, the attender at any given moment, so they're not necessarily the same. Um, but in any case, the, the scope has a focus to it in some way, and then other parts that are more peripheral to this prototype idea. And that we then can zoom in or zoom out in different contexts and take more 
or less behaviors into account, depending on what's going on. And we can also shift our focus depending on what's happening. So let's think of different contexts here. If we think of um, when we're listening but not looking at someone, then the language and the non-lexical sounds are more what's in focus. Versus if we're communicating through a glass wall, you can see someone but you can't hear them, then you're, you're probably gesturing a lot more, trying to indicate uh, what you want to them. Versus in a situation where you have a face-to-face -face communication with hearing, seeing people, who are then paying a lot of attention to each other, and then they might be uh, using a broader scope of relevant behaviors, taking all of this into account. So this idea of a scope of relevant behaviors gives us a way to take account of the different overlapping semiotic systems. Is it language? Is it the gesture? Is it intonation? Is it other things that we're doing? A way of thinking about what is that thing that comes together in that moment. It's whatever falls within that scope in the given moment. It also works on different time scales variably. So this varies, this scope varies according to different usage events of communication. Um, so moment by moment it can vary or um, during the day it can vary depending on how tired you are or what tasks you're doing at the given moment. It also varies across our lifespan developmentally. We can think of um, how it varies from uh, babies and small children who are then maybe using a wide scope of relevant behaviors in their interaction. Adults might be focusing more on the spoken language itself. Um, uh, and then as adults, we then uh, tend to use gesture less as the de facto form of communication. If you're a hearing speaking person and then you're using the spoken language more. Um, and then in the elderly, where then maybe if you have uh, aphasia, you have a stroke or something like that, and then you lose certain abilities and maybe your scope of relevant behaviors also changes. I think of um, Goodwin's work on uh, uh, someone with aphasia and then how they focused on certain communicative forms that they had that were available to them. Um, and the people who interacted with them also then focused more on those forms. And even in terms of the evolution of language, we can think of this, um, how it changed over millennia from uh, pre-homo sapiens who were then maybe making sounds and vocalizations and certain movements um, and then how that changed over time to now current users of uh, language forms that are systematized as language. So if we think of this as a, a model as a possible way to characterize human communicative semiotic systems in, in general, each one has its own relatively stable prototype that's involved um, in terms of what the communicators normally use for their communication. Um, and we can apply this scope of potentially relevant behaviors to it and the focus can shift, but also expand or contract. So this has certain implications and for linguistic research. Um, it's, I wanna point out and emphasize that it's not a proposal that anything goes, that I'm just saying that, oh, it's, we're just, you know, doing whatever when we, when we communicate, rather there is a, a center of gravity of the lexico-grammatical system for face-to-face uh, -face human communication that we're using as what we call language. Um, and the more idiosyncratic types of gestures, let's say what Kenan called gesticulation and intonation can act as what Okrent called overlays in different ways on that. They're normally dependent on the linguistic symbols, but in certain contexts can independently become the, the focus. And the overlap of the linguistic with other semiotic systems um, is something that I think deserves greater attention by linguists um, because then it also tells us something about what is language and also shows that language is not this, not normally this completely, or often not this completely independent system, but is rather interrelated with the other kinds of communication, the other semiotic systems that we have at our disposal that we can use to communicate. What this also means then, another implication for linguistic research is if we take this polysemiotic approach, any linguistic analysis is going to be more complex um, if, we, if we are true to this uh, kind of approach then we start thinking about syntax beyond linear structures and we focus more on what's going on simultaneously, let's say with the intonation, with the gesture, 
as well as what's happening sequentially. So then we need maybe dynamic systems models to better account for what's happening both simultaneously and sequentially um, in different forms of communication. This is something I've thought about a bit, um, proposed uh, this utterance, Kendon's idea of utterance as a starting point for then thinking about um, the theory of construction grammar. Others have also talked about multimodal construction grammar. There's a special issue in 2017 of the journal Linguistic Vanguard um, that looks at different approaches by uh, Zima and Bergs, um, who edited that, looks at different approaches to this question of how can we think about grammar in a, in a multimodal way. And I think this also is a move from, away from a mechanistic view of language, um, uh, where we thought of language like a computer system, for example, and one that then reflects language more as a product of a complex biological system um, of human brains and bodies communicating, taking into account what it is that we're, that we're doing. Um, and so in that sense, you can also think of it as a move that humanizes linguistics in certain ways, puts it more into the humanities, thinks of um, how does language work as a system, but also how are people using language? So this focus on uh, a usage-based approach. Uh, I think that that's something worth paying more attention to in linguistics. So I will wrap it up with that. And I just want to acknowledge the um, Douglas Institute for Advanced Study, uh, where I developed a lot of these ideas years ago on a, on a grant that I had. Um, so still working on some of these thoughts that developed at that time. Um, if you want some further research uh, information, and I can also advertise again this uh, winter school course where we'll do a little introduction for those who know nothing about gesture analysis and are curious how to incorporate this into their work if they're analyzing video material of talk and interaction. Um, so it's really meant for absolute beginners um, just to provide some um, starting points there. So I will leave it at that.